All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, Zoom land is such a funny land. Um, but it's an honor to be here, and uh, and I'm excited about all the participants. And um, we sort of we have a a, a a plan here, and we're going to begin with um, David and I are just going to introduce ourselves, um, and we're going to do that by talking a bit about why we personally care about this discussion around monuments and memorials, um, and then we are going to go into um, doing sort of like an intro uh, conversation to sort of set us up for us to have a kind of common language as we then go into um, some more uh, small group stuff. So at the beginning, there's gonna be a bunch of talking. Um, I am also gonna ask you to use your chat function at some point. All right, but just to begin, my name is Jess Perlitz. Um, thank you, Rizal, for having us here and for um, helping organize this. I am an artist. I am originally from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and I currently live in Portland, Oregon, where I am um, the associate professor and head of sculpture in the art department at Lewis and Clark College, a small liberal arts college. Um, and I, this is a conversation I come to from um, in my teaching, um, I have periodically taught a class on monuments and memorials that's so called Powerful Objects. Um, and it's also that this past year, um, under the auspices of Converge 45's Portland's Monuments and Memorials Project, I led the project along with Mac McFarland, sort of running a year long series of conversations, an exhibition um, of um, some visiting artist talks um, and so on, really to sort of try and think about, you know, this national and international global conversation that is happening around monuments and memorials to sort of think about particularly the national debate and then also to think about um, what's specific to the Pacific Northwest and to Oregon and even more specifically to Portland um, and how Portland fits into that conversation um, and, and, and the sort of broader Oregon region. Um, I will say that in teaching sculpture, you know, the, the fact that I, I label the monuments and memorials class powerful objects um, is telling of sort of how I think about it that I have often found uh, monuments and memorials to be both strangely fragile and symbolic and um, sometimes falling prey to a kind of like plop art, public art that gets put in that is sometimes not so in touch with the, the very uh, sort of context or land that it's on. Um, and at the same time, I've always been aware that it's they're super powerful, that the way that they function symbolically um, is a really uh, powerful and important part of um, the way our culture is functioning. And so as somebody that's teaching sculpture, I've always loved it because it's felt like it's a way to teach that the form that we give to things um, matters as much as the materials that you use, as much as the history that you're engaging, as much as the context in which it's located. And uh, so this is a conversation that I come to both as a sculptor who really believes in the power of objects and also as an educator that really believes that it's a, it's a, it, this conversation in particular is an incredible tool for thinking about um, all these collisions of who we are and how we come together in public space. And with that, I will pass it over to David to introduce himself. Wonderful, thank you, Jess. And Thank you, Roselle, for inviting us and having us and helping to organize this whole event and all of you for coming this evening. Um, it's good to be able to share these thoughts and conversations and hopefully stimulate um, some inspiration on your part to, um, I guess, my hope, I'll say it throughout the talk, but my hope is that, you know, being inspired to think about the communities and values and ideas that maybe those communities or values that you're connected to as a person might be able to uh, be represented in monuments or a different kind of monuments um, in the future. So that's sort of why I'm here in a really basic nutshell, but um, I'm the cultural resources manager uh, for the Grand Round Tribe. I'm a tribal member as well. Um, I come to this monuments work um, maybe 
nearly six to eight years ago, I led some uh, conversation series for Oregon Humanities about monuments work. Um, and those were very open and just sort of solicited input. Um, it was maybe, there's different, right? Topics like this are iterative. They kind of come up and back again and through things. And so we had talked about it and that really being asked to do that work was partially based on that, you know, powerful objects and tribal perspectives on that. Um, for me, monuments are very much like markers of place and story, and a big part of being an Indigenous person from a place, this place, and caring so deeply about it, is that I think that in a lot of ways, monuments are put up to tell certain or specific stories, and there's many narratives or even worldviews or approaches that um, are sort of left out. And yet, while monuments can be these markers of place, I feel really strongly that place can be one of these great unifiers of community, right? So um, I'm Kalapuya. My ancestors, you know, remember the floods that happened here in Western Oregon. We say that we've been here since time immemorial, a time that no one can remember. And the oldest event that we remember are these catastrophic floods that geologists estimate happened between 13 and 18,000 years ago. And that's in part inspiration for the title of this talk tonight, which is writing on the landscape. And we'll hear in my presentation about this idea that our stories are actually held in the physical landscape from a tribal perspective. Well, I also think that a part of that is that while I'm indigenous of that place and it's my story, it's also the story of Oregon. And anyone living here, it's a part of their story because we share it in common. And I think that place in that regard and esteem and reverence for the stories and knowledge and authenticity that can be held in place is immensely powerful. And it has the ability to bind and bring people into fellowship and community with one another. And so um, for those reasons of telling stories and histories that are not told and looking and wanting more from monuments, I care deeply about it, but also because if monuments are these markers of place and story, um, then I think that they should be activated and that they should be active. And I, um, as opposed to static. Um, and so I'm really interested in conversations that happen around that. Um, I am also, I should mention, there's kind of an intersection. Uh, I've served for four years on the State Advisory Committee for Historic Preservation. Uh, it's the state body that reviews National Register uh, nominations. And uh, I also was appointed last spring to the Oregon Arts Commission. And if there's a topic that interfaces with both the arts and historic preservation, it's pretty much monuments, right? And um, that is not a coincidence because of my interest in monuments and how kind of those two different facets come together as markers of place and kind of my contributions to through my volunteer work with those bodies. So um, that is just a little bit about me, a little bit about why I'm here for monuments. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Jess. Wonderful, thank you. All right, I am going to share my screen with everybody. Perfect. Okay. Um, so just to begin, um, the act of commemorating victory or loss or marking the importance of a location or a shared narrative is seemingly ancient to me and something that is done in many, many, many ways. One now well-established way and one way that we know that has been in the news a lot that it has done across the US and beyond is through the construction of physical monuments and memorials erected for a wide range of reasons. And as sites of collective public commemoration and narrators of history, we demand a lot of them, rightfully so. And in that they become both symbols and facilitators 
of our shared and not shared experiences. And though, and I think this is key, though I think that the asymmetry of our experiences is without a doubt one of the most important things for us to be paying attention to in this. I also think it's just as important and prevalent and guiding in how we go about building these things that they are also facilitator, facilitators or that we seek the, for them to be facilitators of our shared experiences. So I also think that in that we give them a lot of authority. And before we begin our discussion today, I just wanted to do a little hive mind activity and we'll see if this works, is that in, your, in the chat, if folks could drop in um, words that they, this is a free association exercise. So words that they think of when you think about monuments, memorials, what comes up for you? All right. So because this is a free association exercise, uh, it is really the first thing that you're thinking about. Please drop that into the chat now and hopefully they can start gathering in there. All right. Um, don't worry about repeated words. Right. In fact, that's kind of interesting. Um, you may start from actually thinking about specific sites or things in your memory. It also might be a feeling, a verb, an adverb, an adjective. I'm probably already for a free association saying too much. But let's just take a moment. And when you think about monuments and memorials, what words come up for you? And can you drop those words into the chat? It looks like so much fun that I've started to add into. Yeah, good. So thank you all. This is wonderful to see all of your comments and, and thoughts. I, I couldn't help. And the commonalities and trends. And I almost feel like I'm seeing people respond now to others, which is wonderful. Right. And what it jogged your memories and your thoughts. Um, I'll give you guys a few more minutes to do seconds to do this. All right, I am going to read some of these out. Now it becomes like a funny uh, a poem for us of our, our collective consciousness here. Here we have war, committee, marble, marble, death, majesty, learning about history, marble, history, history of the colonizers, powerful, politics, power, white men, wealthy people, York, hegemony, discourse, power, memory, white people, confederacy, stories, bronze, pedestals, memory, victor, confederate, white people, spatiality, colonialism, curious, remember, narrative, memories, stolen narratives, the past, men on horses, heritage, presidents, colonizer, domination, inadequate, recognition, rhetoric, literal, wealth, men, trees, men on horses, fixedness, extraction of resources to make, history, memory, history, stories, views, victorious, story, living memory, history, it is fun incomplete history, tourism, pedestals, native houses, men. I like that tourism, John. Remembrance, fill in history, pigeons, remembrance, awe-inspiring, artist, daughters of the Confederacy, complicated, permanent, getting to complete. Nice. All right. Wonderful. Okay, we're gonna do another one of those in a second. Um, but first, as we enter into conversation today, um, we're all coming from such a wide variety of backgrounds um, with intersectional, meaning overlapping identities and experiences. And so with such a differing base of knowledge and not knowing who everybody is and not being able to sit with you in a room and understand exactly why you're here today, um, I always think it's helpful, especially because David and I do want to enter into a group conversation. I always think it's helpful for us to have just a couple of footholds 
right? So things that we can turn to um, and that that is in part kind of what David and I are gonna be doing in this beginning part, right? Um, so I think as I introduce, my job here is sort of to introduce the contemporary lay of the land of monuments and memorials and sort of enter us into this like debate and discussion that has been going on, which I think everybody is probably pretty aware of because you are also attending um, this talk today, but I also don't know actually on what, on what level you are, you are coming to this with. So I thought we could start with the Vietnam um, War Memorial as a starting place with some with maybe a bunch of you have visited, I don't know, maybe some of you have never seen it, but let's just revisit it. Okay. Um, the Vietnam War Memorial is designed by Maya Lin and it was dedicated in 1982 and it's built on the National Mall in Washington, DC. And I don't know if people remember or, um, uh, or need a rem um, ever knew that it was wildly controversial when it was built, right? Um, that Maya Lin um, was a, a 21 year old student of architecture uh, when she won this competition to build this project on the National Mall. Right? Um, when the competition was opened up, when they asked for proposals, it was a blind competition, meaning that they weren't looking at who the artists were that were submitting the proposals. And they had three uh, stipulations for what they wanted from the memorial. Was that one, it needed to contain all the names of the dead and missing. That two, it needed to be reflective and contemplative. And three, it needed to make no political statement. I always have these lingering questions and I hope all of you have some thoughts or questions that come up for you during this that maybe you can make note of because it will also help us when we come time to actually have some conversations and smaller breakout groups. But something I always think about in terms of that, that third stipulation is that is it ever possible for something when it's a monument and more memorial to not actually be political, right? And what, and what is the political and how does that function when we are making work like this? Anyway, the competition was blind juried, which means that Maya Lin won. And I, and you know, lots of people felt that possibly if it had not been a blind jury that Maya Lin would not have won because not only was she 21 years old, she also had no professional experience. She was still in school. And she was Chinese American, born in Ohio with very little personal connection to Vietnam. And that was part of the controversy. But the uglier side of the attacks on Maya Lin's personhood were buried beneath a more seemingly acceptable upset about the design, right? People felt that this design was bleak that it was carved into the earth like a wound, um, that it was not grand or imposing um, like the more familiar monuments on the National Mall, like if you can picture the Lincoln Memorial or the Jefferson Memorial. Instead, it was comprised of two granite walls that formed a V-shape sinking into or a carved out of the earth, right? And as folks um, touched or made rubbings of all the names of those who were died that are engraved on it, they could see, they can see, it's still there today, I don't know why I'm speaking the past tense. They can see, you can see your reflection in the highly polished black granite as you're standing in front of it. It was protested. Um, it, the most vocal sort of active group of, of protest was organized by a group of veterans. Yeah, they were so successful in, in, their, in their protestation of it that there actually was an additional amount of funding given towards making an additional mo monument to sort of satisfy some of their requests nearby. But mainly what the, um, this group of activists were saying was that it felt like this memorial was like a black sarcophagus and that that felt like an insult portraying the war and thus their sacrifices as shameful and something that it felt like the artist was portraying it as something that should be hidden. But the truth is also that in many ways, Maya Lin's memorial was attempting to rethink some of the traditional, seemingly traditional language of monuments and memorials in our culture.
I mean, here's something that maybe we can all recognize as a seemingly more traditional monument when we're talking about this contemporary sort of like monument of the memorial debate. debate. And this is one of the United States largest historic Confederate statues, which was erected in 1890 in a time when Confederate symbols provided a like rallying point for advocates of racial segregation and oppressive Jim Crow laws. One that like many, many others in the States became a flashpoint, particularly several years ago. And eventually, relatively recently, this one um, was removed. The monuments we have inherited from the past have always been both symbols and facilitators. And they have become symbols and facilitators in new ways, it seems to me. Their dismantling and removal shows a demand for change. And like we are gathered here today, they become a way for us to think about how they have functioned and what they might be going forward. There have been a variety of tactics, as you can see from these images here, that have been used to take down the problematic or contested monuments in public space, and it is still going on. There have been individuals that take matters into their own hands, and then there are long drawn out community discussions, even commissions formed. Then you have cities like Baltimore or New Orleans where the decisions are made by the mayor and they're taken down in the middle of the night to try to avoid harm. And each approach of course has its own issues. But I think the question of like, how might communities create and engage in the processes needed in the deconstruction and construction and reimagining of monuments and memorials is an important question. And that's a lingering question I have and a guiding question. So maybe at this point before we go on, let's pause and let's do another word gather. And this time um, the question is when you think about the recent actions, debates and discussions around monuments and memorials, what words come up for you? So this is again another free association. And we'll give you a moment to drop those words in there. And at first I was asking about monuments and memorials generally, and now I'm asking you about the more contemporary debates and discussions. All right, I'm going to read some of these out. Let me see if I can start from the proper beginning here. All right. Distortion, rope, misguided response, confusion, anger, frustration, confederates, confusion, pioneers, George Floyd Square, streets, flowers, shops, vigils, contentious, petty, racism, controversy, value of the land false heritage, misdirected anger, action, destruction, vandalism, division, hate, cancel culture, excuses, genocide, correcting the record, wrong approach, erasure, politics, responsibility, pop-up monuments, political, politics, accountability, whiteness, protest, America, debate, anthrocentric, clinging on to something that is done, reclaiming public space, anger, old narratives, reclaiming the story, living history, blood, prayers, in the very place, discussion, colonial, justice, be cautious, think carefully, change, false pasts, art, 
lack of capacity to acknowledge the entire arc of history, grasping, enslavement, reconciliation, respect for the living, incomplete pasts, hope. History is only about present. How can we build rather than tear down? What does it look like to do better? Direct action, recycle. Nice. All right. Let me see if I can bring all your little faces up here. Um, I'm wondering if anybody here uh, wants to uh, just talk briefly for just a few minutes about something that they think that has been constructive about the recent monument and memorial de debate. I know that's a big ask because we're just starting out here. But is there anybody here that feels willing to contribute for a moment and just let us know um, just for a couple of minutes something that they found constructive or engaging, interesting about the monuments, contemporary monuments and memorials to debate. And if you, I, I think you can, we've got a hand here, but maybe we'll do more around here. I'm sorry, I thought I unmuted and I hadn't yet, but I can speak. I'll just say real quickly, I think it was great because it encouraged dialogue and allowed people to express the pain they felt or maybe another emotion, but it, it encouraged dialogue. And we hadn't really had any up to that point that I knew of, probably both of you who are um, academics and professionals in this area did know, but I didn't know. So that's a good part. Great. And can somebody, one, can we have somebody else share if they're open to it? Um, thank you, Mara. Uh, who, somebody who is living in a city um, where they have watched um, a monument or memorial come down and sort of what that was. And maybe we have, we have John has raised their hand. John, can you just talk for a moment about your, where you live and your experience? Hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thanks for putting this uh, together. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Santa Cruz, um, California. I'm faculty here at UC University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, one of the things that has recently happened here is um, the removal of some of the mission bells. Um, I'm not sure if you're outside of California, how familiar you are with that, but um, the mission bells were actually put up in the early 20th century, early 20th to mid 20th century to sort of represent uh, the missions that were throughout the state of California, the Spanish missions. Um, and the missions which were, which were quite controversial and quite deadly in many ways to the indigenous communities here. Um, there has been a push specifically uh, by the Amamutsun tribal band, who uh, are the, the people of Santa Cruz. Um, and they were able to remove um, one of the mission bells that was actually on UC Santa Cruz campus, um, and also uh, two of the mission bells that were in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and it was a really amazing um, experience to watch that happen. Um, it was, of course, very contentious. Um, some of the folks at UC Santa Cruz who helped push that along uh, got very vitriolic letters from, from all over the nation. It was covered on CNN and things like that. Um, there were also a lot of issues in Santa Cruz itself. Uh, at the same time, though, it was um, ultimately, I, I feel, overwhelmingly positive as a number of communities had the opportunity to come uh, before city councils, before large groups, and talk about you know, what, those, what those bells actually meant to Indigenous groups and, and the loss that it was connected to and the death, actually, that it was connected to. Um, so to see that in real time was um, really something sort of amazing um, to witness. Great. Thank you, John. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Let's see if I can go back here. All right. 
Okay, so yeah, the thing I will say is that it is very clear in all of this that, that monuments and memorials function symbolically. And the truth is that symbol, symbols really matter. And the fact that people are arguing about monuments or street names or school names is a discussion, discussion worthy of engaging rather than shaking one's head at. And engaging means that rather than immediately taking a stance, it's about trying to parse out what is all at stake and why. And it's not actually in the end an argument about historical fact or tit for tat, but actually at its core, there's a call to rethink how we go about these things. Our monuments and memorials represent not only the individuals that are sometimes depicted, for example, but what it is we value. We know that. And it shows us also that symbols are not static. They change. Things are built as one thing and with time, they can also at the same time become something else. The rethinking of monuments is not new, right? There are ways to completely shift the way we're thinking about it all, which I hope we will get to, and which in part I think David is also advocating for. But as we're entering into this, let's also keep it conventional for a second here in that, here are two sculptures that use the language of traditional monuments and memorials, the authority that seems to be part of an understood language to talk about something. In fact, a term that could be used for both of these, and in some ways also Maya Lin's Vietnam War Memorial as well, is the term counter memorial, right? Which is a term that's used in, it's like a, in art. Um, which was first coined in the late 80s by a scholar, James Young, who was trying to describe the works of German artists who were dealing with the memory of the Holocaust. And it's an approach that's also sometimes called like anti-monumentalism that seeks to commemorate while intentionally resisting and questioning traditional approaches to public monuments and dominant historical narratives. Two examples of this, of counter monuments that we have um, located in Portland, Oregon, where I'm speaking to you from today, are these sculptures of York. They both work with the authority that monuments carry as a material in their making. And they both reckon with the symbolic and recognize the way in which they facilitate history and contemporary narratives. Okay, York was Clark's slave. He was enslaved by Clark and he was a member of the Corps of Discovery, the Lewis and Clark expedition. There is very little written about him in the journals, but what we do know is that he was integral to their survival. And we also know that upon completion of the expedition, he received none of the financial rewards that the others did and he was denied his freedom and treated incredibly cruelly. In Alice and Sarah sculpture here on the left, York Terra Incognita, we have a sculpture where he is depicted crudely, average height. And that's done intentionally, both as a way to talk about the fact that we don't know what he looked like and to resist the traditional depiction and exotification of martyrdom or heroism and race. He is not larger than life on a pedestal in a grand location, but rather average size positioned on a rock with the land and placed just off to the side of the path rather than in the traditional centered location. Thus engaging and implicating the viewer in a different way and also including them in a different way in part of the work. All right, the image on the right is a bust also of York. That was a clandestine midnight anonymous operation that happened here in Portland. It was an empty pedestal that was in Mount Tabor Park. Um, it was empty because it was a, a sculpture of Harvey Scott, who's a prominent 19th century conservative newspaper editor who lived here, who was quite opposed uh, to women getting the vote. And that sculpture was toppled. And so there was this empty pedestal in the park. And though the sculpture of York that went up in its place used the official understood traditional language of monuments, it was actually an unsanctioned guerrilla install made out of materials that make it look official. 
And then it was eventually vandalized and then taken down, but it ignited a conversation that is still being had today. Speaking of the official traditional language of monuments, we all know that there are sanctioned official monuments and memorials that carry with them a certain kind of authority that function as symbols and facilitators. But we also know images like these three things I put together, things built by people out of need, hope, an attempt to remember, reconcile painful and important experiences, cont uh, contemplative, urgent, and a desire for something to be shared. All of this is part of this conversation. A rethinking of monuments and memorials that is again being called to be rethought and expanded is happening right now. But in fact, we also have some very old knowledge that we can turn to to help us rethink the desire we have to make markers and to tell stories and to remember and how we go about that. Which is now maybe where I will turn over to David with whom it's a total honor to be working with um, today. And I will stop sharing David so that you can take this over. Great, thank you, Jess. Um... There was one question. I don't know if it can be answered uh, simply from the chat, but um, while I'm transitioning and sharing the screen, you might take a look at that. How does presentism fit into memorials from Mary Helen? Is that where the, right, yep. right. I think, you know, so we're gonna um, have a moment um, for broader questions and answers. And I do think the question of like, how time works into monuments and memorials is key and important. And I think we will talk about it a little bit with David, but maybe we can touch on some of these questions um, all together after David talks. Perfect. Um, writing on the landscape, reimagining monuments and memorials. You're looking at an image that was painted of the Willamette Valley um, that depicts the Willamette Valley, the open prairies, some timbered areas and there's even a fire in the distance that's being lit and burning off the back ridge. Um, this was drawn of an area that's close to my home here in the North Willamette Valley. Um, it was done by Paul Kane in the mid 1800s. And uh, I believe that there's a lot written in the landscape of this photo or this image, this painting is the reason why I've included it here. Um, Oh, it sounds like maybe the image can't be seen. Can you see the image, Jess? I can see it. When I'm a presenter, this, hmm. I think other people can see it too. Okay. Maybe, that'll work itself maybe it was just a slow load. Maybe it's loading slowly. Okay. Well, I will change the slide. So a part of the naming of this title that I, that we put forward is about writing on the landscape. And this comes from one of my mentors uh, who I had the opportunity to work with for a number of years uh, early in my career in the field of historic preservation. And it was this idea that our history as indigenous people of this place isn't written in books, it's written upon the landscape. And a part of that is through the work that I've been able to do is going out into the places of our ancestors and going to important locations, important features, and talking about our creation stories, talking about how the land um, has existed throughout time and the memory of our people and how things exist. And so this idea that um, when we're doing monuments work, um, there's translation that's essentially occurred and that it's one of the ways as a society that today people are sort of leaving a mark and writing on that landscape. And I think that there's this parallel to this idea that Eric Thorsgaard captured when he said, our history is not written in books, it's written upon the landscape. The images you see, unless you're familiar with Western Oregon history, might be kind of confusing. Um, on the left is an image of the floods that inundated the Willamette Valley with over 400 feet of water that I talked about earlier. And on the right is the largest meteorite that was ever found in North America. 
and it was actually found uh, near present day Westland, Oregon, but yet there's no impact crater there. And it's believed that it was actually a large glacial erratic and that it had become encased in ice. And as these floods ripped down through the area, this iceberg uh, with this large meteorite embedded in it floated down along the river and then landed and melted in Westland, Oregon. Um, that was found by early settlers um, after it had been celebrated as a sacred object for thousands of years by our people. Um, and it was transported back to New York City, where today it's a part of a museum there in Manhattan, and it sits on the fifth floor of that building, this object of this place, uh, one of our most revered sacred objects and storytellers. Um, and the story, the, uh, this idea is that so much of the story of this place um, and those events that we remember from a long time ago are tied up in this object. And even though it's been moved to New York, um, we go on an annual trip back to New York and take our young people and we interact and we provide education about it. And we still have this relationship over time. Um, so that's a little bit of the idea of like the realm of possibility of what types of things can be written on the landscape, how it gets manifested into meteorites that ends up halfway across the United States. And I thought it'd be helpful for that kind of context. Um, I introduced myself um, as a Kalapuya person, um, my ancestors are from the Willamette Valley. Um, over 30 tribes and bands of people were removed from across Western Oregon to the Grand Round Indian Reservation in the 1850s. And so the images that you're looking at here are one of the early sketches of explorers that sketched a Kalapuya man with a bow. Um, then you have an image of myself below that in my cedar hat and my sports coat. Um, and on the right, you have an image of uh, the interior of all of the areas that were seated, seated meaning um, transferred, for lack of a better word, without getting into Indian law, uh, to the federal government from tribes that came to Grand Round. Um, that's that dark green area, and it roughly stretches from the crest of the Cascades to the crest of the Coast Range and all the way from the Columbia River to the California border. It's over 14 million acres of lands. Um, and so when I'm talking about place and knowledge and some of the work that we're doing that has informed this work, um, I'm talking about the connections to those places and how they came to manifest um, on the reservation. So the other part leading into this, and I'm going to get to presenting some of the conceptual ideas that we as a community put forward in this open call for monuments and, and, and memorials, is we did some work as a community. And when we, we got a group together and we talked about what, what do Indigenous monument art examples or the idea of monuments, like how does that look in our ancestral society, right? And I'm going to use some terms throughout this and midway through this pre presentation, we're actually going to go through a whole term section. So, so bear with me while I do it on the first presentation. And then when I present the second proposal, uh, maybe some of those terms will, will start to register a little bit more. Um, but within that, one of the commonalities of values or things that we observe from the ways that our ancestors in this place, prior to any Europeans arriving, the cultural practices where monuments or memorials seem to manifest is there was a certain like utilitarianness um, to the action. They were involved also in like sacred ceremony, ritual, uh, place based. Most of them were temporal or ephemeral. There wasn't this idea of permanence. Um, and then this idea of identity creating or reinforcing identity was sort of one of the commonalities that we saw from different cultural practices. So when I saw this open call for monuments and memorials, I knew that one thing that I felt like unless we as a as a tribe, a removed tribe, you know, uh, people from the Portland area were removed to the Grand Round Indian Reservation, 
And I sort of had this realization that indigenous voice was pretty unlikely to exist or be represented unless the tribe put forward a proposal. I think a part of this that was a little bit challenging is that this concept of like marking place or marking the landscape as in the form of a monument as an individual is kind of a foreign idea. There's, there's more of like a communal need and community values and service. And so what, what was really nice about the open call was that it was open-ended and I was left this ability to say, well, instead of doing maybe like typical of me just coming up with ideas, <clears throat> I'm gonna gather together a group of individuals that I, I know have context or experience and we're gonna talk about these ideas and see if we can't address up to five different ideas that we think that we could propose for monuments and memorials just to get the conversation going um, so that there's representation of tribal people in our homelands. And, and that's a major part is that there's a lot of intention over time of removing native people, um, assimilation and these other actions. Today, um, it used to be shorter, but now with traffic, it takes a good hour and a half to two hours sometimes to get all the way to the reservation. And so Indian people were removed from these places. And while we have tribal members that live in the city today and come back and interact and have work, um, in order to continue to be a part of the conversation and the dialogue, there really needs to be intention in sort of going back into our homelands. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at an image of um, one of our proposals. This was concept art that was created uh, for the exhibit itself that was eventually featured from those proposals. It was called Prototypes. Um, and the image is showing a silhouette of a traditional canoe with people paddling in it. And one of these ideas that we sat down, we thought about Portland as a place from an indigenous concept. And Portland isn't the center of things the way that it is today. Um, Portland was a traveling place. Um, the nearest villages to Portland, there was a village in St. John's uh, just outside of the city. And there was villages up at Willamette Falls where Oregon City is. And that whole area in between, which is today sort of the center and where most of the population of the city of Portland lives, um, it was a traveling place. It's where people went up and down the river in canoes. It's where people gathered traditional foods. The river was so wide compared to what it is today. The river actually stretched all the way back into 10th Street on the east side. Um, and it was this large braided wetland sort of environment and area. And so we thought, well, how fitting would this be that we have this idea to create silhouettes of canoes and mount them to floating dock structures on the river. So when you look from one edge of the shore to the other, you have the ability to see this idea of cultural practice that is relevant to, the, to place in the past, but is also actually one of the most uh, visible ways that tribal people today actually are seen in the city, which is when we bring our canoes to the city and we paddle on the river, right? Which is a cultural practice that still goes on today as we practice our annual canoe journeys every year. And that often includes travel through downtown Portland in our traditional canoes. And so we said, you know, for us, this really captures this idea of traveling with our ancestors, uh, which is the name of the piece. And it represents the historic past as well as signs of our ongoing persistence in place in the community. Um, the proposal has these canoes being slightly larger than life, which would be um, in some cases up to 50 feet long and six to 10 foot tall and numerous canoes, not just one canoe, but <clears throat> uh, in, in groupings of three or five. Uh, one of the things that you'll find in our traditional art form is that the numbers three and five are important and we'll find those throughout our art forms. And so uh, that was one of these ideas that came forward. Uh, this idea hasn't moved any further from where we were, um, but this uh, kind of was one of my favorites. <laughs> um, let me move to the next slide. So now we're going to go into some key terms. You've heard me say some of these words along the way. 
and it's tools that we have for sort of understanding some aspects of some of this like tribal work and engagement. Um, the images that you see here, one is the interior of a ceremonial lodge by Paul Kane near present day Vancouver, Washington. And the second image down low is an image from the Grand Round Plank House. And the people in the image are doing a fun dance. Um, a part of why I put this is that these are both plank houses, plank house from a really long time ago, a plank house today. You'll see similar architectural features, uh, but notably there's like lights in the bottom one. And if you look real close, you can see an exit sign over the door, right? And clearly some change has happened. There's translating. And this is really helpful to understand how we use two of these terms in our community, ancestral and traditional. So ancestral is the way that our ancestors did something, but traditional is the way that we can do something in honor of the way our ancestors did it, but with change over time. Um, and in essence, this is this idea that we don't have to be static and only in the past to continue to be cultural and to continue to like be indigenous people, like change over time is allowed, right? Um, if change over time wasn't allowed, Italian people wouldn't be associated with tomatoes and Irish people wouldn't be associated with potatoes, right? Like you have these sort of like memories that people have from a culinary world, but those were all new world foods that weren't even available in Europe until after European settlers came to North America. So it's important that we don't place that lens on indigenous people, that people aren't somehow cultural if they're translating or adopting things uh, to make room for the times that we live in today. And then lifeways is a term that you'll hear oftentimes in our work, which is a customary manner of living, a way of life, also a custom practice or art used in reference to how indigenous peoples of the past, present and future conduct their lives with respect to their, sound, their surroundings, practices and beliefs. And so a lot of the work that we're actively doing in our community is about lifeways. And you'll regularly hear a phrase about keeping it living, which was something else that came up in our monuments proposals work was this idea of something being static is sort of makes it dead and that there's a need of renewal and engagement and sort of lifeways work in order to keep these things living. Um, Another term that you'll hear me use often is indigenous. I often get questions and ask about, should I use indigenous, native, Indian? I say, you know, I use all three. It depends on what I'm talking about. But when I'm saying indigenous, I'm often being specific to refer to like native people of a particular place with those connections in time. You can also be indigenous in a place. I've, you know, told people, you know, a Maori person who's indigenous of New Zealand can be indigenous in Portland and still be indigenous, right? It's a part of the way that they carry themselves and other ways of living. Um, and we have a PDF handout of this as well. So that's something that we can kind of circulate with all these key terms. Uh, but there's a, a practice that and, and inherently the work that the tribe is proposing boils down to indigenous placekeeping work. And in order to understand that, it's sort of helpful to talk about placekeeping, which I think is this term that's very useful and important within the monuments and memorials conversation, because it's a response to all this work that has historically been done with placemaking. Um, and placemaking is the process of community development that leverages outside public, private, nonprofit funding to strategically shape and change the physical, social character of a neighborhood using arts and cultural activities. Uh, however, one of the results of this very intentional work can often support gentrification, displacement, real estate speculation, and perpetuation of marginalization of indigenous histories and narratives. So one of the responses to placemaking has been placekeeping, which is the idea that there's stories of place and of communities, not just with indigenous peoples, but all people that come to call a place home at some point. And that it's important uh, for the active care and maintenance of place and its social fabric um, in order to, uh, for the people that live and work in a place to 
you know, preserve cultural memories associated uh, with a local area. And this has sort of become popular in the field of urban planning. Uh, recently, uh, some scholars out of Arizona State University, uh, Wanda Dalla Costa and Selena Martinez has put forward this term indigenous placekeeping. Um, and it combines this idea of the placekeeping response to placemaking with sort of acknowledging that indigenous people have work to do in this area. And that um, it's a way to engage and prioritize ecological, historical, and cultural relationships to place while bringing the presence of indigenous histories and futures into focus. Um, so this is sort of some of the theoretical background to like get under the hood of what began to inform sort of this work and our proposals. Uh, we have a few other terms and I'm actually gonna turn it over to Jess to introduce those. So I've got, have you at intersectionality, Jess, or you can pass it back to me and I can keep. Funny, yeah. Um, I think that these were just terms that I had meant to uh, touch upon just in, in my first little introduction, but uh, intersectionality is just um, a term that was originally coined in the late eighties by the uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, it's a, originally a legal term um, that she then just used to write about, which is to describe the ways in which um, systems of inequality based on gender, race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, class, other forms of um, discrimination intersect and overlap. I also didn't describe the image here, and uh, this is an image of the Ridgefield Plank House, uh, which is a plank house located in, uh, or Cathlopodal. Uh, it's located at the Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge in Ridgefield, Washington, and it's a Chinookan house, um, which, you know, could be seen as an action of Indigenous placekeeping, where Native people, uh, researchers, scholars, got together uh, with government officials and essentially re-erected um, a modern interpretive and cultural space for gathering um, to occur. And you have active ceremony going on while also having a place for education and work. Um, and the image that you're seeing is some of the traditional art form of the region, the lower Columbia River. Um, you're seeing a, a human and a figure uh, that is sighted above the circular door that two children are going uh, into. Um, so this is just sort of an image of that and I wanted to share that as an example. And we have two other terms, structural racism and ideology. And this is an image of the toppling of the statue in the park blocks uh, here in Portland. I think, um... Structural racism is also something that has been uh, discussed a fair bit in the contemporary discussion around monuments and memorials. And maybe sometimes people have heard it referred to as institutional racism or systemic racism. Um, but that is just a term um, to talk about a form of racism that is embedded in the laws and regulations and policies and practices of organizations and our society. So it works in various often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity and um, ultimately manifests in discrimination in so many areas such as like criminal justice, employment, housing, um, healthcare, education, political representation, and so on. And then ideology, I think, you know, again, there's sometimes these terms that I think we, we know so clearly, but we don't always unpack them. And that's also something that comes up a fair bit um, in the contemporary monument and memorial discussion, but also um, I think one that maybe is always thought of or sometimes used uh, critically in terms of um, negatively, but really all it is is that it's a shared belief system um, and it has been used negatively, but it is a set of opinions or ideas that um, help form various political, social organization and action. Great. So, this is the second proposal that was featured in the prototypes exhibit. Um, we're, we're calling this first fish herons. Uh, the image that you see depicts five um, sculptural elements of herons on plinths somewhere near a waterfront. 
Um, it looks here like they're placed somewhere near what may be downtown Portland because there's a handsome bridge that looks somewhat like the, the uh, Hawthorne Bridge, maybe in downtown Portland. Uh, but it, you know, a part of this was not defining something too specific because it felt like we're just introducing this idea into the world and we needed to leave room to actually bring it to life. Um, and I'm actually really happy to report that one of the things that I'm actively working on is an intergovernmental agreement uh, between uh, the Grand Round Tribes and the city of Milwaukee um, to uh, have the public art, a place for this public art installation. Um, what it would be is something that's unique is pedestals or places to mount uh, herons would exist in the park throughout the year, but only during the spring fish run would the herons be mounted uh, in those locations. This corresponds to a Clackamas um, cultural tradition of uh, placing carved herons down by the river to watch for the first fish. And we have a, a tradition of first fish ceremony in our community uh, where the first fish is caught and then a large uh, feast is prepared and the community gets together and eats that fish and returns the bones to the river. And the herons, which have sat watching for the first fish until the point where the fishermen catch the first fish, are actually brought to that ceremony. And when we had these conversations about identity and cultural practice and ritual, we said, well, we do this at a small scale for our community, but what would it like to look like to bring that cultural practice and teaching that's been happening in this place as indigenous people of this place for as long as we can remember, what would it look like to translate that into public art and make it um, authentically available to the public to participate um, with the tribe hosting that activity. And um, what it, we came up with this idea of um, instead of wood herons, like what we use, actually having metal or other potential mediums. Um, and the other idea behind this is that a lot of our art forms and cultural knowledge aren't common knowledge or known. And one of the best ways that we could do that is while we always want to have one of our native artists be the artist for one of these pieces, um, we can pursue inviting other artists as a cohort to meet with our tribal members, learn about the cultural history, and then be invited to design one of these herons each year. And then, uh, since it's only a temporal installation, those artists would actually keep the uh, heron that they constructed and received a stipend for, for in order to develop. And a big component of this is that since it's happening every year and the herons are only installed uh, for roughly three months, there's a dedication event every year that brings people to the river and brings attention to the fish of which one of the challenges that we have today is there's a good likelihood that if things keep going as they are, that there may not be fish in the river anymore during our lifetimes. And this idea of bringing awareness um, that fish are in the river by actually at the park having herons uh, at the park invisible during the fish run, we hope sort of brings um, awareness to that sort of occurring while creating a community event around cultural knowledge and practice um, where there's this engagement between the tribal people of this place an excuse to sort of return to this location at a certain time of year, interact with the public um, and engage. And so those are some of the elements of, you know, that we talked about in this idea of what would an indigenous monument or our effort of, you know, what does it look like to do better? Like if, if we see other people having challenges with monuments, I'm not interested in just, you know, erecting the same type of thing that exists, like <clears throat> there's cultural knowledge for herons. So, you know, one could say we could just put an image of a heron on top of one of these big plinths that has a statue torn down. But I think that it sort of fails to miss the opportunity, it fails to miss this opportunity of rethinking how we do monuments and actually like facilitate community participation and engagement 
and knowledge transmission about place and place-based knowledge. Um, for these actions, I wear it rather as a badge of pride uh, because I think that while the intention behind this work and this proposal is very constructive, um, I did have somebody refer to it as subversive. And I think that what's useful about thinking of this as subversive is that it is subverting the idea of what a monument is supposed to be. And that's the goal. And that I'm I, by, by us submitting this work, we're trying to push the idea of what people traditionally think of monuments in a way that is a little bit more con, uh, indigenous placekeeping, a little bit more inclusive and community engagement. Um, and that's some of the work that's sort of going on with this. And I'm really excited to report that, you know, I'm hopeful that something like this and as a regular annual practice will start to occur every year on Milwaukee Bay, potentially as early as uh, 2023. So really exciting uh, type of work. That is the proposal here. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um our i think let me what's that thank you yeah i gotta pivot now i gotta look back at our chart what's next well i think what we were gonna ask folks is just if there are any clarifying questions um but but also you may have some questions that you want to talk about um and that this is the moment maybe to also uh make note of those write those down because that, that is actually gonna be incredibly helpful later but in the in the most immediate is there anything that people just need clarified out about what was just presented or an additional question maybe for David around that? Are we good to continue? See your question, Katie. Can you talk about how preservation and storytelling about natural features on the landscape that have served us as monuments to indigenous people could occur? Yeah, you know, one of these, this idea about storytelling and like places to do that from. Um, there's features in Western Oregon, uh, sometimes referred to as prayer seats. It's a term and it essentially denotes like it where to look, like, like it sort of denotes on the landscape where you're supposed to sit and then what you're supposed to look at. Um, and it's almost like instructive. So uh, ancestrally, there's that word, um, our ancestors had these locations at like promontories and places where you could view. And it essentially guided the person who went to those locations to like sit and look at important features and sort of then, you know, the story sort of tells itself. One of the, some of the challenges that we have is there's different taboos that go on around things. And so one of those is for instance, storytelling for many of our peoples in Western Oregon, you're only supposed to tell stories from the time of the first frost until the time of the frogs croaking in the spring, right? And this has made a whole new thing of like how we're trying to translate and figure out what it means to record stories, right? And then it's like on YouTube and people can watch it, right? And it's throughout the whole year. One of those ways within a museum setting is some people feel that you can paraphrase things. Um, there's also the idea that it's okay to tell stories if it's not in a performance sort of nature, but it's more about informational and conveying information to other people. So this is this idea that there's all this cultural work to sort of be done about what was taboo, how it works today. And if you wonder what the consequence of telling stories in not the right way or not the right time, you, you're stung by bees. That's essentially what happens. Um, I took a hard warning to this because I used to be a beekeeper. And while I was stung rather regularly, which might have been a lesson, uh, I eventually really took it to heart and don't tell stories anymore in summertime. Uh, when I had an allergic reaction suddenly after being stung over 50 times in one year, and I almost died from a bee sting. So I don't tell stories anymore at that time of year, but that's because I believe it. Um, I do think that the power of interpretation uh, to do some of these things in a site. Um, I think that integrating into the natural landscape is really important and that it's gonna be places that have view sheds and not all places are going to be as useful to, to do that work in those locations. Ho hopefully that helps.
All right. Um, we are going to prepare to do our breakout sessions. Um, as, as a part of that, um, we're going to break into smaller groups. Uh, from that, there's going to be a three kind of guiding questions for the group to have with each other. Uh, thank you. We've just posted those, just posted them in the chat. Um, we're going to share these and kind of talk through them again after our break. So if you're looking to take a break, go ahead and do that now. We will be back. Uh, how long do we have? A five-minute break. So let's say we'll come back at 7.22. Um, and with that, um, I'll read off the questions if, if you haven't found them in the chat. And we'll share those again before. But feel free to go on break till 7.22. So the questions that we have are introduce yourself, your name, where you live, and a monument memorial you remember from growing up. Why is it so hard for us to reimagine how we go about making monuments and memorials? And if time allows, what are some new ways how we might build monuments and memorials? How does your new approach improve what still presents problems? Do you want to add anything else, Jess? No, nope. that's great. All right. Thank you. See you in five minutes. 